To be called a landlord is one of the most prestigious titles there is especially in the money world. To the lay people renting the properties, it feels like the landlords are having it easy by relaxing every day as they wait for rent at the end of the month. However, it's not always roses as getting tenants can be challenging, and even getting the tenants to clear their monthly accrued rent can even be more burdensome with difficult tenants. When one landlord decides to call the police on a tenant that has deliberately refused to pay his rent for seven months, he gets more than he bargained for, a crime scene of 12 decomposing human bodies buried inside his kitchen. Welcome and welcome back to Tavern Crime Chronicles. We explore strange, mysterious, chilling, and unsolved cases. If you have the nerve for fascinating stories, this is your channel. We approach our cases with empathy and extensive research. And if you appreciate our true crime storytelling, kindly support us by subscribing. Thank you. Today's story takes us to Rwanda, a beautiful country in the Great Rift Valley of Central Africa. Sitting on 10,000 square miles, Rwanda is the fourth smallest country on the African mainland with a population of 14 million people. Despite the fact that it is a small country, it is the fifth mostly densely populated country in the world with its lands mostly occupied by the Tutsi, Hutu, and Tua, all drawing from one cultural and linguistic group, the Banyarwanda. We cannot talk about Rwanda without mentioning its beautiful people. Her women are known to be one of the most beautiful and tallest women in the world. Rwanda's economy is one of the fastest growing, despite basing mainly on agriculture of tea and coffee. The Rwandan president, His Excellency Paul Kagame, has been so instrumental in bringing Rwanda on the world map. From sponsoring one of the popular football clubs, Arsenal, to hosting international conferences and sports tournaments, it has boosted its tourism becoming its biggest foreign exchange earner. And yes, I cannot go without mentioning its beautiful scenery, good roads, and the fact that it is the cleanest country in Africa. But it's not been all roses for the young African country, and as the world even tries to grapple with what befell them in the Rwandan genocide, some heinous people will not let the country shine in its new glory. For in the small village of Busanza, a serial killer was walking silently among the people, his crimes lurking in the shadows. But as they say, every day is for the thief, but one day is for the owner. The devil stripped him, and he was left to shame as all his crimes were laid bare. Well, relax, grab a drink, while we dive into the wretched heart of a serial killer. This is the story of Dennis Kazungu, born in 1989. Dennis was a calm man at first sight, and well respected in society. Not much is known from his childhood, but besides having been an English teacher, the 35-year-old businessman owned a motor car spare parts shop. With the money made from his business, Dennis rented a house from a one Augustin Shiram Bear, his landlord whom he paid diligently for most of the time. He stayed alone in the house and would be seen occasionally by neighbors in the company of young ladies. It's for such reasons that the Bible cautions against staying alone. In Corinthians 9 the Bible says, But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Dennis solicited the services of prostitutes on many occasions because as a young man without self-control, it's difficult to stay alone without sexual satisfaction. Unfortunately, Dennis started to feel ill, and his body weakened. He went to see a physician and was diagnosed to be HIV positive. For most, that diagnosis will leave you shocked and feeling empty, like you are one step to your graveyard. Dennis went home and tried to comprehend the horrible news he had just received about his health. To him, that meant that he was dying anytime soon. His life as he knew it would soon come to an end. And as he lay on his bed plainly looking at the ceiling with tears in his eyes, something sinister crossed his mind. He was dying, yes, but he couldn't go down alone. The people who infected him had to pay the price and go down with him. Fun, he had. It was now time for revenge. He had mourned his miserable life 
and now gathered himself for his revenge mission. He started frequenting nightclubs where he had previously bought the sex workers for familiar faces. He would lure them to come home with him as it was usually done. There he would then rob, them strangle them to death and then bury them in the kitchen where he had dug a shallow grave. This he did multiple times, stabbing some with a knife in anger as he accused them of infecting him with the deadly virus. I don't know if it was because of his life disillusionment and hopelessness, but his business started to go down and he could no longer afford to pay his house rent. His landlord, Augustin reminded his several times and even asked his to vacate his premises if he couldn't afford to pay his house rent anymore. Their landlord-tenant relationship was ruined when Dennis deliberately refused to clear his rent arrears for seven months, although his landlord had been patient with him and even refused to vacate. He saw it fit to report him to the authorities who came to evict him forcefully out of the house. September 5th, 2023, Day of Reckoning. As requested, the police officials came to throw Kazungu out of the house, and one of the police officials said that he put up a fight as they evicted him. He was apologizing and crying excessively which raised the police's suspicions, and they detained him for investigation. There, he confessed all his deeds like he was a sinner repenting to a Catholic priest. To him, it was like he was carrying a burden and wanted it to be lifted. This was his out because he knew he wasn't going to stop his newfound wretched hobby. This prompted the police to investigate his residence, and there in the kitchen, they unearthed 12 bodies, some about a year old, and some new. Among the recovered bodies were 11 females and one male. Many questions going around was if he was using male prostitutes too, to which he declined. In his defense, he said he killed the male victim so that he could assume his identity upon arrest. The police realized that they had initially arrested Dennis earlier in July on suspicion of robbery and rape, but had been released due to lack of evidence. If only they could turn back the clock, all this would not have happened. In fact, his neighbor, Irene Mukasin, who lived a short distance away, confessed to have heard screams coming from his house, but was not sure what to make of it. About two months before he was arrested, Irene was horrified when a young woman came running straight to her house one afternoon. Her feet and hands looked like they had been tied, but she had managed to break the restraints, hence the bruises. Shouting at the top of her lungs, she asked Irene to hide her because she was going to be killed. She at first thought she was seeing a demon and ran out of the house to see what was chasing her only to see Kazungu coming as he had followed her. On seeing that she probably had company, he turned and walked towards the main road, together with the other neighbors. Irene reported the incident to a local leader who unfortunately did not pick interest in the issue, saying that it was a mere argument between Kazungu and a sex worker. Not too long after that, a similar incident had occurred. Another woman who had spent the night at Kazungu's house was in the same trouble just like the first one and equally broke free running to the neighbors for rescue. She said he had robbed her in the morning by holding a pen to her throat and demanding for her mobile money pen. Her face was bruised, and it was clear that he had beaten her badly. The neighbors would again report the case, but still got the same answer for the system, doesn't care about the issues of sex workers. The last person that escaped Kazungu's claws was a young woman who screamed at the top of her voice because she was unable to ran out of the house on her own. Neighbors ran to her rescue and demanded that he opens the door. He came out singing a Swahili gospel song pretending to be oblivious of their accusations as if nothing was going on. The neighbors were adamant and decided to pick up stones and throw them at his house and over the roof when they realized he wasn't going to listen. On seeing how serious the neighbors were, he let her go and she ran through the back door. Reporting the case was again to no avail and no action was taken against Kazungu. But they would in a few days witness the horror that was Kazungu's murder house. During interrogation, Dennis confessed that he learned to kill his victims from watching films about notorious serial killers. 
This showed that his crimes were premeditated as he carefully tortured them to reveal their bank details by using any weapons in the house, including pens. Surprisingly, Dennis requested not to be reported in the media for the heinous crimes he had committed so that he could protect his name, a name he had long lost if you ask me. He requested the court to hold the hearings of his case behind closed doors, a request the judge denied. A handcuffed Kazungu was brought to the courthouse in a prison van and was loudly booed as two policemen escorted him inside. The courtroom filled with the victim's relatives was up in arms for him to be given the maximum sentence and for justice to prevail. One relative to one of the victims screamed at him calling him a dog for killing his daughter and he was dragged out of court to observe order. Kazungu Dennis confessed to have in fact murdered 14 people and not 12, but the police couldn't locate the bodies of the other two he claimed to have killed. He pleaded guilty to all his crimes and was remanded to prison. The jury are now seeking for a maximum sentence of life imprisonment for his heinous crimes. Such a hateful and hopeless murderer doesn't deserve to be in society and should be locked up for the rest of his life, secluded and alone. And this comes to the end of Kazungu's serial murders, a man who lived a life buying sex workers and later killed them for infecting him with HIV, a sexually transmitted infection. Tell me, what do you think about this case? Do you think Kazungu deserved to be angry at the sex workers? I think our lives are in our hands, and although he was buying sex workers, he should have been at least responsible enough to use protection. And to the sex workers, there are always better and safe ways to make money, because expecting to be in a stranger's bed every day to be able to earn a living is quite absurd for anything can happen. And that includes murder. Well, if you like the way we presented this case, or are even interested in real crime documentaries, don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and even share the thrills with your friends who may like the same. See you next time.